Obviously, the sorts of rollouts that we're starting to see begin in the UK, potentially very soon in the US. It's a situation where the benefit outweighs the risk because these are you know, sort of emergency authorizations for high risk people, aged care environments, uh, and the such. What questions do you still have before we get a widespread rollout across the broader population? Well, first of all, it's a great achievement for the scientists at Pfizer and BioNTech and all of the people that have worked to make this happen. This is a record, by far a record, in terms of rolling out a vaccine. And the preliminary data that we've seen in press releases really is very exciting. But um, there still remain some important questions left. There's a question about durability. How long will the protection last? There's a question about will these vaccines protect against death and ventilator, ventilator uh, dependence? Will they block forward transmission? And finally, how safe are they? So I think those are four very important questions, and it will take time to sort out these answers. So I think that the trials are set up to deliver this information, and as we go through 2021, I think more and more information will be available at these four important points. So obviously AstraZeneca looking to conduct more trials. It looks like the Pfizer and the Moderna options have the head start at this point. Seth, I'm wondering if you take a look at the MN and RNA options versus the vector vaccine at this point, is one more superior, more effective, uh, I guess in the longer term, perhaps more adaptable to you? Well, the mRNA vaccines are really novel technology, and no mRNA vaccine has ever been approved. So it's very hard to speculate about the features of the immune response that they'll engender. I think that the um, AstraZeneca and the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccines are based on adenovirus vectors, and there's some more information about those. They were used in the Ebola virus uh, vaccines. So there's some information about those, but we are at a further point along the spectrum of using a live virus vaccine. And those historically have engendered the strongest, most durable immunity. And the uh, prototypical vaccine, the first vaccine, was Edward Jenner's vaccine for smallpox, which he discovered in 17... 98. Mm -hmm. And our vaccine is very close to what Edward Jenner is using. It's the most successful vaccine ever. It eradicated smallpox, the only disease ever to be eradicated. And it results in many years or even decades of immunity. And many people think lifelong immunity. So we're pursuing that. And uh, Merck has two live virus vaccines that they're pursuing, measles and VSV. So one of the great aspects of the effort going on all over the world is that many different approaches are being tested. So I think that in the next uh, few years, we'll have a lot of information about how to protect humanity from this. And that's important because this virus, this disease, is not going to go away. I think we're in a pandemic now, but the expectation is that this will be endemic and it will be something that humans will have to contend with as long as we're uh, on Earth. Seth, you just mentioned that uh, your, the excitement, that so many vaccines have been worked on, they're being rolled out around the world. You also mentioned the question of safety, that people aren't exactly sure when, because in the past, some vaccines did hurt some people, limited numbers, but definitely there's a little risk there. Are other countries transparent enough about their trials, about their results, to trust them? Uh, would you advise your friends, family, to say, you know, stick with U.S. developed vaccines, forget China, forget Russia, forget other countries? Well, first, you're correct to point out that not every vaccine is safe. The classic, really frightening examples were the RSV vaccine trials in the 1960s, where vaccinated people and infants died at a higher rate than unvaccinated or sham vaccinated. So vaccines are not necessarily protective. And that's something that everyone will look very carefully at as we see what's happening. The next thing generally about safety is that different people are going to have different uh, 
risks associated with, mm -hmm. with vaccines. So, for example, traditionally older people do worse with vaccines, but they need them the most. And younger people, um, for example, uh, college students, are at relatively low risk of getting sick, but they're also uh, likely to have the best tolerance. Okay. Now, getting to your point about other countries, as far as I know, I think the scientific community is pretty similar around the world. So I would have confidence um, in a vaccine developed in another country, but obviously they would be similar to United States countries publishing their work in a scientific journal. I think for this kind of research, nobody would really cut corners because it would not take very long for people to find out that the results were not what they were. I know that you're a fa you believe that very strongly uh, that there should be a big commitment from the U.S. government, probably from governments around the world, to continue to work not just on the vaccine for this pandemic, but for things that may happen next. What needs to be done? Trump's, Trump's team had Operation Warp Speed funding. Uh, I don't know if your company got any of that, but it does seem like it's at least been a factor in this race to get a vaccine as fast as you can. What needs to be done now? That's an excellent question, and it's really a time for the Biden administration to, in, in my mind, show leadership and make a sustained commitment to vaccine development, because the United States and other countries are really caught on, you know, caught unprepared for this, and this will not be the last pandemic. So we need to expand our technologies generally. We need to expand manufacturing, R&D, and other capabilities. But um, Warp Speed was a fascinating example of focus. They focused on eight programs, poured billions of dollars into uh, you know, these, these eight programs, and got remarkable results. But at the same time, they really did not spread around bets uh, evenly. So our company is not funded by Warp Speed. As a matter of fact, our company has not received any government uh, support. So I think one of the things that I hope will emerge is that uh, the United States government and other governments around the world will be making multiple bets, smaller bets, on earlier technologies. I think the future of COVID vaccines uh, may not be the mRNA vaccines. I think we have to look to a day when COVID vaccination is a routine childhood vaccination, vaccination much like the MMR is today, mumps, measles, rubella. So I think that for us to get from here to where we are, think of it as a marathon, and we've just run the first mile. It is wonderful that Seth, we have hope that, yeah. Seth, I was gonna say, it's gonna be quite a marathon because I wanna bring up this chart that shows just the low level of willingness that we see so far. Only four countries at this point look like they'll be able to reach that 80% cover needed for herd immunity. You can take a look at the N in France. Barely half of the population surveyed are willing to get the vaccine. So if we don't get that high level of take up, where does that leave the world with the virus? Well, it's very unfortunate to hear and see about vaccine hesitancy. Hopefully, um, information and, and education will change that. But there is a point at which governments have the authority to compel vaccination in order for people to attend school or, or for uh, to work in certain places. So I think that it's probably too early in what we know about the existing vaccines or the ones that are uh, under review to start compelling people. But at the appropriate point, I think it may come down to that because Vaccination is very important, not just for the people who are getting vaccinated, but for public health generally, because vaccination with an appropriate vaccine can make people less contagious. And that's one of the most important functions it can serve. It's kind of like in a forest fire analogy, wetting down the forest.